So those are the 10 specific topics I wanted to cover with, with relationship to an introduction to the Ten Commandments. However, I left something here to the end that I talked about several times in previous videos. And that is, we have the new covenant of God at his mountain, Sinai, and he had his people led by Moses, who was a shepherd. And it's very interesting because we talk about the fact that new covenant at the mountain of God in Jerusalem, given by God, and the one that we follow is called the Good Shepherd. Very interesting side-by-side -side comparison. So we talked about Christian scholars like Dr. John Kareed, like John Gill, and now the ESV Study Bible itself. Christians scholarship talking about commentary on Deuteronomy 29.15 where they agree with the Jewish scholars that this means that the Sinai covenant is the Sinai covenant is meant to be forever. It doesn't end. It doesn't end by the very words of God. But then we get this discussion in Christianity that the new covenant in Jesus replaces the old. And I already told you that the word replace or replaces or replaced is nowhere found in any good English translation. I'm talking New American Standard. I'm talking ESV. I'm talking the King James Version. It might be other versions, but these are the central scholarly versions. It's nowhere. And we talked about the fact of the new covenant, the new testament, the new, new covenant in Jesus, refreshing the new covenant at Sinai. And how is that done? This is what we want to take a look at. This is what we want to see right now as we end off our introduction to the Ten Commandments. One of the things that we have taken a look at is that Juda Judaism and Christianity both agree that the Sinai Covenant is missing a piece. The great Rabbi Akiva, who was alive in 50 to 135 35 AD, look what he says. This is, this is quite amazing. This is taken from the Babylonian Talmud, Makot 13b. Rabbi Akiva says, those liable to receive karat are included in the category of those liable to receive 40 lashes because if they repented, the heavenly court absolves them of the punishment of karat. Now, let me just stop there real quick. Karat is a Hebrew word meaning to be cut off or cut from or separated by cutting. It, it's a specific word used for cutting a covenant. But it's also used again and again where God will say, you will be cut off from the people. If you do this action, you'll be cut off from your people. And nobody understands what it means. When you actually study the Bible, the rabbis have debated this for 2,000 years and even longer. And even among Christian scholars, there's a debate. What does this cut off mean? Karat. Cut off from Israel. Cut off from, from the people. Cut off from the people appears 22 times in the Torah, and cut off from Israel appears six. The other references for karat are, karat are normally cutting a covenant. Therefore, karat, continuing on with what Rabbi Akiva says, therefore, karat does not absolve them from the punishment of lashes. Those liable to be executed with court imposed death penalties are not included in the category of those liable to receive 40 lashes. As even if they respond, repented, the earthly court does not absolve them of execution, and one is not punished by the court twice for performing the same transgression. The point being here is this. Karat is associated with intentional sin. A great verse to take a look at is Numbers 15, 22 to 31. 
You can look at that yourself. It's another study completely. Because when you actually go to Numbers 15, 22 to 31, you're going to see that God is talking about unintentional sin, and that unintentional sin can be cleansed by the sin offering. But then there's intentional sin. It's called sin with a high hand or done specifically on purpose. In Hebrew, it's Yad Roma. It's the picture of a hand being raised in rebellion. And so here, Rabbi Akiva is basically saying, if you repent, these sins of karat, these sins that are intentional, can be forgiven. But it's very fascinating because the Bible does not say that. God, there, there is no place where God says, this is the solution for a karat. This is the solution for intentional sin. Then we go to the great rabbi, Maimonides, and he was alive from 1138 to 1204 AD. And when we, when we read in the Laws of Repentance, chapter 1, section 1, Maimonides says, the more one confesses and elaborates on this matter, the more praiseworthy he is. And also, those under an obligation to bring sin offerings and trespass offerings, who bring their sacrifices for sins committed either in error, unintentional, or willingly, okay, those, that's karat, that's what he means, those sins that are committed intentionally would be karat, you're going to be cut off from your people, and there's no solution, but look what Ma Maimonides says, they are not acquitted of their sins by means of these offerings until they repent and confess in words, in other words, sacrifice alone cannot bring acquittal, confession is a sine qua non, and without it, repentance cannot take place. Sine qua non basically means it, it, is, it is absolutely required. And what's my Amidity saying? There's no sacrifice in the Torah that will acquit you of your sins. But repentance, along with sacrifice, will. Sorry, you guys, the Bible does not say that. But it's quite clear that sacrifice alone doesn't do it. And they agree with the writer of Hebrews. Because in Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4, it starts out for the law, meaning the Torah, since only a, since only as a shadow of good things to come, etc., 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 we get to the end of those, that, those first four verses, and it says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, implies karat, or intentional sins. And even, of course, Paul. What does Paul say? He's at his first stop in southern Turkey on his first trip to make disciples. And he's at Antioch of Pisidia, a large pagan city in central Turkey that was built to model Rome. And he's there at the Jewish synagogue. And we read this in Acts 13, 38 through 39. And he says, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him who for, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. Now, every Jew would be really excited in here. He say, wait a minute, the Torah does not proclaim forgiveness of karat, does not proclaim the forgiveness of intentional sin. Unintentional sin, no problem. This is in Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4, you read it, it talks about the sin offering. For what? For unintentional sin, for mistakes, for errors. So here, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and through him, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all the things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Even Paul is talking about the fact that there's no sacrifices, no sacrifices whatsoever in the Torah that satisfy God's demand for the penalty to be erased and our total forgiveness. The covenant at Sinai has no blood sacrifice for intentional sin. It has no blood sacrifice for karat. And this is not a Christian view only. We've seen that. Now, did Jesus address this? Let's take a look. This is David Stern. 
He is a Jewish Messianic scholar. If I recall, had studied at Hebrew University, and one of the exciting works that he wrote was the Jewish New Testament commentary. And one of the things that he did, this is in relation to uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. His comments are, there are two words for new in Greek. So in other words, you guys, when we take a look at the word new in English, it comes from two Greek words, not just one. Kainos and neos. Neos means something which has never existed before, whereas kainos carries overtones of freshness and renewal of something which has existed. I wanted to give you some pictures of this. By the way, ne Neos, its uh, Strong's number is G3501, and Kainos, its Strong's number is G2537. So I was trying to help a friend of mine understand the definition of these two words. It's pretty simple. I was having coffee with him, and I finished my coffee. As I finished my coffee, I told him, okay, let me explain Neos to you. With regards to Naos, I finished my coffee, and I'm going to go up to the counter and get a new cup. What if they did this? In other words, they gave me a brand new cup. They replaced it with coffee. That's the meaning of Naos. I get a new cup filled with coffee. However, when I take a look at Kainos, I have finished my coffee. There's nothing left. I'm going to go up and get a new cup of coffee. And what do they do? They just fill this coffee up. So in other words, my cup is refreshed. My cup is renewed. The cup didn't change, but I was able to be filled again. Here's another example that I love, and that is of the rainstorm. <laughs> and as rain refreshes the land, after a long period of heat or drought, you know that, you know that. We experience that all the time in the Midwest. So does the new covenant in Jesus at the Mount of God in Jerusalem, Canaan. It refreshes the old covenant. It renews it. It gives what the Sinai covenant was not meant to do. That's Paul. What Jesus did, the law of Moses, the Sinai covenant, did not do. The way for us to be totally cleansed of our sin has been provided and the Sinai covenant has been updated. The covenant at Sinai did not cleanse us of sin. And this is both as we find in Judaism and in Christianity. So emphasizing more about this word kainos, there's some real clear biblical examples how these words are used. And I want to emphasize kainos. We'll go to Jeremiah 31, 31, when it talks about the new covenant. And say, yeah, there we go. Right in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, it talks about the new covenant. Now, when you actually go into the Septuagint, we find that the word new in Jeremiah 30, 30, 31, 31 is kainos, and it translates the Hebrew kadash, and kadash has that equivalent meaning to refresh, or renew. So Jeremiah is writing under the influence of God and talking about, I'm going to be giving you a refreshed covenant, a renewed covenant, a fixed covenant. Matter of fact, Kadash has the additional idea of being repaired or fixed. We go to John 13, 34, and Jesus is talking about a new covenant. He says, here's a new covenant I give you. Love one another. I mean, it's a, love one another. That's Leviticus 19.18, where in the Hebrew scriptures, one of the most important scriptures in all of Judaism, and really for us as well, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said it's the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Who's your neighbor? It's your fellow disciples. It's your, it's your, your wife, your husband, your kids, people you work with. Your enemies, according to Jesus, even love your enemies as yourself. The word there is kinos. He doesn't give us a new covenant. He gives us a refreshed covenant because he says this, love one another, as I have loved you. And how did Jesus love us? How did he add to 
The Sinai covenant is basically saying, love each other as I have loved you, and the way I loved you is I died for you. We give our lives to people in our love. That's, that's a way of showing our love. In other words, that's not just saying that we're Christians, but it's actually doing something that people can see and say, wow, look what it means to be a Christian. What's very interesting is we talk about the inauguration of the new covenant, and that definitely happened at the Last Supper. And we look at chapter 22 of Luke, verse 20, or 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, uh, verse 25. And it's the cup of the new covenant, a fixed covenant, a renewed covenant, a refreshed covenant. Jesus is God. And already, he says he does not change in Malachi 3, 6. Jesus says he came to preserve the Torah and the prophets, not to do away with the Torah and the prophets, but to fulfill them. It seems as if he's doing something to the Sinai covenant. Is it possible that he said this? Because when we go into the inauguration of the new covenant in Matthew 26, verse 28, or in Mark 14, 24, what is very interesting is Jesus blesses the wine and he gives the cup and he says this represents the blood of the covenant, not the blood of the new covenant or a fresh covenant, the blood of the covenant. Now we have to understand those 11 sitting there, Judas is already gone. What covenant did they understand is a covenant that affects all Jewish people at that time? They had no New Testament at that time. It was the Sinai covenant. And those 11 disciples of Jesus were under that, and Jesus is talking about the blood of the covenant. Is it possible he meant the blood of the Sinai covenant because the Sinai covenant did not have a blood sacrifice that could take away karat, that could take away, take away intentional sin? It was not replaced. It becomes new in that Jesus fixes it. He renews it. The blood required to cleanse sin now is now added. The Sinai covenant, the peace is now found. The Christians got it. <laughs> and for us, the Jews need to be told the good news. Like at Pisidia and Antioch. At Pisidia, Antioch, when G Paul tells them what the Torah could not do, Jesus did. I'm paraphrasing. Read it. Those believers, those Jewish believers they weren't believing in jesus they were excited and they were they said you have to tell us more about this please come back and tell us more it was as if we see those concerns by akiva and those concerns by maimonides in the in the 12th century that the torah did not address the forgiveness of intentional sin and so we want to be those Christians who have the good news like Paul and be able to tell Jewish people who believe in the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, they do not believe in Jesus as Messiah, and to tell them what Jesus did. Jesus refreshed it. He is the missing piece. Perhaps that's what he meant when he said, it is finished. For me, this has been an amazing journey. And I just am so thrilled by God providing me with so many amazing scholars. Dr. John Curry, Dr. David Stern. Looking at others here on my bookcase here, Dr. Joseph Shulam, and so many others. And things become so clear, knowing the difference the difference between Aseret Hadevarim and Aseret Mitzvot. The Ten Statements or the Ten Commandments. Just that simple. Ten Commandments are not even mentioned. But there's Ten Statements. Because we're taking a look 
at Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. It just doesn't take away the idea of Ten Commandments. That There could be more. So let's go with the statement. Let's go with that ten, ten, the Ten Commandments. But what we want to do, now that we understand that, we want to study the rest of the words and the Ten Commandments in their context. And on top of that, this is God's covenant. A God's covenant that will never end. And on top of that, it's for everyone. And it was work that was unfinished. Something was missing. And Jesus, our Lord, finished it. Could it be that we have two covenants? The Sinai covenant, that's which we call the old covenant. And the new covenant in Jesus. They exist side by side. One has the answer the Jewish people have always been looking for. And the rabbis tried to answer, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Maimonides, with their own opinion. But their own opinion, there's no Bible verse, there's no instruction by God himself that says karat, intentional sin, is forgiven in this way. None. There's no sacrifice that was provided. There was no blood sacrifice. But then Jesus says, I'm the blood of the covenant. Did he mean I am the blood sacrifice that's missing from the covenant? So indeed it was missing Jesus. And no wonder Jesus said it is finished. It was missing the Lamb of God. So we're at the end of the introduction and now we're going to study Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Just to let you know, this is the last video in this series. The rest of them will be audio only. So you will see them appear uh, with the video beginning. And it will seem like it is a video. But after the beginning, after that introduction, which lasts for about 40 seconds or so, it will go into an audio section. So we want to get and put the Ten Commandments now in their context. And so that indeed the Lord can help us understand the deeper aspects of what they mean and an richer understanding of Aseret Mitzvahot that are in Aseret Hadevri, the Ten Commandments inside the Ten Statements of God. So till then, Yevarekeka Adonai Yeshua. Hase shel Elohim. Ve Shimeka. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord Jesus bless you. The Lamb of God. And may he keep you.